Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Justin Stearns. I'm the director of the Arab Crossroads Studies Program here at NYU Abu Dhabi. And this year, we have been doing a series of public lectures on Syria. In the fall, we had um, Joshua Landis, and earlier this spring, Bassam Haddad, who came and spoke. And now we're very fortunate to have Professor Wendy Perlman. The impetus, I don't think Wendy even necessarily knows this, but the impetus for me and setting out, out this series of talks came when I attended the panel at Mesa a few years ago, upon which these three figures, as well as some other people, spoke about Syria. And then when we began thinking about who to bring to talk about Syria, Today, which is such a not only important subject, but one that is, has so many, is, so many different angles, is multivalent. If, if, if any of you were here for Professor Landis or Professor Haddad's talk, you will have remembered that they approached this in a very much kind of a macro or historical political fashion. And when I was fortunate enough to hear Professor Perlman's talk, I was very struck by the extent to which she was approaching the story from a different perspective and was also going very much through uh, a series of personal encounters with Syrian refugees and displaced Syrian people in various places. And I felt this was an important way to complement some of the more perhaps macro standard political analysis, which, which is no doubt valuable, is only one side of the experience. So let me, with that, Brief introduction to tell you a little bit about Professor Perlman. So she's an associate professor of political science at Northwestern University. Her degree is from Harvard. She has two books to her name, starting off with a book entitled Occupied Voices, Stories of Everyday Life in the Second Intifada, which was a Washington Post bestseller and came out in 2003, and more recently, Violence, Nonviolence in the Palestinian National Movement, which came out in 2011 and was uh, foreign policy's runner-up to best book on the Middle East. Since this initial focus on Israel and Palestine, she has turned her focus to, to Syria and has authored several long-form journalism pieces um, entitled, uh, among them, Love in the Syrian Revolution and Fathers of Revolution. Um, and I, I uh, surmise, although I don't know, that these in some ways form the basis for a forthcoming book project on this, on this, uh, this subject. So I'm, I'm just, I feel very lucky to have her here with us this evening, and if you could all just join me in welcoming her. Thank you. That's such a kind um, introduction. And what Justin didn't mention is that we met each other in an Arabic language program in 1999. So we've been following each other for, for quite a while, um, before Syria was on my sites and, and most people's sites. Um, yeah, I'm delighted to talk about this, this research today, and especially coming so close to what yesterday was the, the fifth year anniversary of the start of the Syrian uprising. I'll try to give us a sense of um, uh, retrospective in some ways, where the revolution came from, what it means, uh, what it, where it's arrived today through stories that I've been collecting from displaced Syrians. So observing the toll of horrific violence in Syria, Many dignitaries and observers say that they are bewildered by what seems like a senseless tragedy. How do Syrians themselves make sense of it? What can we learn about their stories and their personal experiences in the conflict on making their country? Of course, perspectives on what's happening in Syria are as diverse and varied as the parties to the conflict are themselves. To uncover how at least one part of the Syrian population has experienced revolution, I've carried out interviews with about 250 displaced Syrians. I began in Jordan uh, doing interviews in 2012 and then returned to Jordan in 2013 and moved on to Turkey. Uh, again, being in Turkey 2015, 2016, and most recently in Lebanon. Actually, most recently doing an interview this morning here in Abu Dhabi. So I'm always doing more interviews, basically talking to Syrians wherever I can and asking them to tell me stories about their life. Uh, though my interviewees have varied by age, class, gender, region, the overwhelming majority of the people with whom I've spoken were opposed and are opposed still to the regime of Bashar al-Assad. Most of them supported or participated or at least identified with the uprising against that regime. So I focus mostly on that one slice of the Syrian mosaic. I recognize that it's just a slice, but it's one whose stories are worth listening to. And I'm using this material to write a book that is something of an oral history of Syrians' experiences of authoritarianism, of protest, 
of war and of exile. Today, I'd like to share with you one of the things that has struck me most prominently coming out of all of these stories and their diversity. And that is, I would propose that these individual narratives coalesce into something of a collective narrative, one central theme of which is fear, political fear. More specifically, I'd argue that the arc of these stories, the arc of people's lives when they talk about their relationship to the state, to society, to politics, reveals four different types of political fear. They differ by character, their sources, their function, and their way of shaping people's relationship to politics, to society, sometimes even to their own sense of self as Syrians. Fear, I propose, is something of a window into understanding what the Syrian uprising means, what the war means to those who've lived it. So tonight I'd like to share a selection from some of these testimonials and stories and interviews and take you through these four types of fear. And I'll conclude with something of what we can learn from this research. Again, this isn't the only way of understanding and interpreting these stories, but it's one way of making sense of various different personal experiences. And I'd like to share that journey, that trajectory with you. The first type of fear emerging in people's stories is a silencing fear. This is fear existing and functioning to uphold the coercive authority of the state and the Assad regime. This is the kind of fear that dominated Syrians' experiences when they talk about their lives before 2011. So as we know, after decades of coups and instability, Hafez al-Assad seized power in 1970 and established a strong authoritarian regime. He won some popular support through redistributive economic policies and also by maneuvering to win the allegiance of key sectors of the population but at the same time severely curtailed political freedom and used an omnipresent security apparatus to suppress dissent. This, of course, reached its heights, climaxing in, uh, with the suppression of various types of dissent beginning with in, in the late 1970s and climaxing with the scorched earth assault on an armed insurrection by the Muslim Brotherhood in 1982 which warned a generation of Syrians what would happen to those who dared to challenge the regime. The effect of this severe repression and silencing fear can be captured as one uh, young man from Homs described it to me. He said, Hafez al-Assad tamed the Syrian people by using security and military rule. It was like when you have a wild animal that you want to make a pet. Syria became a big farm. For Syrians, life meant waking up every morning, oops, I think I've, oof, yeah, waking up every morning, going to work, and coming home at the end of the day. Bashar al-Assad came to power in the year 2000 after his father died, and many had great hope that the young head of state, Western educated and so forth, who presented himself as a reformer, really would be a reformer and bring change. The key realm of change were neoliberal economic policies and privatization that in many ways intensified conspicuous corruption and inequality while gutting the state welfare, safety, security net on which many Syrians depended. Meanwhile, security force rule and the threat of punishment for those who would engage in dissent remained. One man from rural Dada described it to me as, we don't have a government. We have a mafia. And if you speak out against this, it's off with you to Beit Khaltu. This is your aunt's house, an expression we have that means to take someone to prison. It means forget about this person. He'll be tortured. You'll never hear from him again. For many Syrians I met, the experience of this kind of rule through silencing fear was best captured in the expression Hush, whisper, the walls have ears. That is a sense of pervasive surveillance, a network of undercover informants, penetrated society, sowed distrust among members of society, encouraged society to police itself. 
the young man described it to me as, my father and brothers and sisters and I might be sitting around and talking. And then suddenly, each would glance at the other as if to think, don't turn out to be security. This kind of disposition to silence through and due to a silencing fear could be so internalized that it might even be a disposition that people carried with them even after they left the homeland. One man from the Damascus suburbs who left Syria as a child said to me, when you meet somebody coming out of Syria for the first time, you start to hear the same sentences. Everything is okay, Syria is a great country, the economy is doing great. It'll take him like six months, up to a year, to become a normal human being, to say what he thinks, what he feels. And then he might start whispering. They won't speak loudly. It's too scary. After all that time, even outside Syria, you feel like someone is recording. And that's something I found in doing my interviews. Sometimes people would talk to me, but they were looking over their shoulder, even very far away from Syria, um, worried that fear they carried, carried within them. So the result of this fear, this silencing fear then, could be a fear that and silence that helps perpetuate the authoritarian system, leading to a kind of, of acquiescence, even when people are quite discontented with the way things were. Of course, there were transgressions. Not everyone was silent all the time in all sorts of ways. These very cartoons by Syrian cartoonist Ali Farzat show that people could push the boundaries of political permissibility to different degrees, in different ways, sometimes loudly, sometimes subtly, changing over the decades as the political situation changed. But many still shared the view that expressed by one drama student from Hama to me. He said, a Syrian citizen is just a number. Dreaming is not allowed. And when many people described their lives before 2011, it was with that heavy sense of a silencing fear and something of a resignation to that silencing fear. Political corruption and repression limited the horizons of possibility. For many people, to hope for change seemed foolish. To fight for change seemed reckless. This, the dominant feel of fear before 2011, and then a radical, dramatic change in people's experience of fear beginning then. I would see this shift in 2011 as something of a shift from a silencing fear to the experience of fear of one of being surmounted. People wrestling with their own fears to overcome it, to work through it, to go out and express themselves. So as we know, of course, the Arab uprisings beginning in Tunisia and in Egypt, and many of you will remember at the time outside observers of Syria and many Syrians themselves saying, oh, Syria, it's a kingdom of silence. Maybe this wave of revolts will pass from country to country, but Syria, Syrians are too afraid. The Syrian regime is too strong. The security forces grip is too solid. It's immune from the revolutionary tide. Of course, Syria wasn't immune. It went out too and went out with force. There was a complicated combination of factors and impetuses that led to the birth of the uprising in Syria. Elements of spontaneity, elements of strategic planning. As we know, there were some small demonstrations in Damascus, and then protests in the southern province of Dara that gained force. Mass presence were sustained, grew into a national uprising. I'm happy to talk and go day by day, hour by hour in those beginning days and weeks to the Q&A if you'd like, to talk about how it was, the miracle happened, that there became a national uprising in Syria. But what I'd like to focus on now as far as the experience of fear is the ushering in of a new experience of fear as a personal barrier to be broken through. Many who participated in protests described it using an expression that was really heard throughout the Arab world in 2011, if we recall, that how did an uprising begin in Syria? The barrier of fear was broken. In Qasr Hajis al Khawf. What I found in talking to people, asking them, how did the barrier of fear break for you? When, why, what was it like? What I found in people's stories is a sense that fear never disappeared. 
People were aware of the possibility of being killed, of being arrested, of facing the most severe kinds of repression. Fear didn't disappear, but people mustered a new capacity to work through or despite fear. Maybe feeling afraid, but going out anyway. In this, this shift in experience of fear from this heavy weight, an impediment imposed from the outside, like the silencing fear of the previous era, instead fear being experienced as a terrain for challenge, for personal challenge, for personal action and transformation, almost a landscape on which people could act and realize themselves and do what they themselves didn't even think they were capable of doing. So how did people break through the barrier of fear in Syria? There are different factors and different pathways. Here's just a sample of some reflections from the people with whom I, I spoke. Some people describe breaking through the barrier of fear as if an opportunity had arisen, given the atmosphere of the Arab Spring, feeling like if Syrians did not grab that opportunity, they might never know when they would get it again. And once they did take it, there was no going back. So here's the story of a 20-something from Dara who describes the first protest, the first mass protest in Dara on March 18, 2011. Protests began in a small neighborhood mosque and a small procession wove through the streets, reaching the major mosque in town. And that was where this young man was waiting for it to come because he was in the know. He was in a group of small planners. And he said, when I first saw the demonstration marching toward me, I had such a weird feeling. It was the first time I ever saw a demonstration. I was so happy I was going to cry. Nothing like that had ever happened before. Until then, we'd only had pro-regime demonstrations. Then the first two martyrs were killed. The second day there was a funeral. We didn't expect anyone to come because of the killing that had happened the previous day. But we went to the funeral and more than 150,000 people attended. People came from all the surrounding villages. We were afraid to go out, but then the chance came to us. Do we let it go? If we lost it, does that mean we'd never be able to go out again? Also, we knew that if we went back, the regime would come and arrest all of the young people who went out that first day. They'd all die in prison. So there was no choice. We'd entered a road with no return. Another element of breaking the barrier of fear is something of a generational shift. And this was mentioned to me again and again, both by young people and their parents' generation, that there was something special about this young generation that broke the barrier of fear and perhaps dragged the older generation behind them. And here, a 30-something from Ha describes it to me. He says, if we'd listened to our parents, we never would have gone out. That generation lived through Hema. My aunt was pregnant at the time. My parents took her to the hospital. They had to stop at checkpoints on the way there, and they saw corpses lined along the road. My father carries that sight inside him until now. He still has that fear until this day. Whenever we would watch anything on TV related to politics, He'd say, turn off the television. He couldn't even bear to watch it. My generation is also afraid, but not like them. I now say to my father, why were you silent all of those years? We say this to their entire generation. And I heard this echoed several times. One man said to me something of the sort of, you know, that you're, it's different if you, to know that fire burns than to put your hand in the fire. Our generation had the, knew, we'd heard stories that fire burns, but their generation had put their hand in the fire and still had the scar to show for it. That's what made us different. One older man said to me, you know, we used to dismiss this younger generation. We called them Gila Gel, because they always had hair gel in their hair sort of baggy pants wearing young kids that they seem to be seri not serious, superficial, not care about politics. But he said, they were braver than us. They went out first and they made us brave too. So there's a generational component to breaking the barrier of fear. Another element, of course, is that once regime forces killed people and their blood hadn't been spilt, there was a sense of outrage and indignation that could bring people out into the streets who had hesitated to go out previously. 
This sense that unarmed, peaceful protesters had been killed created anger, perhaps a desire for revenge, but also, I think, created something of a moral questioning, triggering people's sense of duty to their communities, to their principles, and driving them to go out if they had been afraid to go out previously. So several people express it to me in this sense of this kind of a way. A mother from Dara said, the barrier of fear began to break when they started to kill people. You would think, I'm not better than those people who got killed, so I have to go out too. Another man said, when the first person got killed in the demonstrations, people started to say to themselves, the question now is whether to enter into battle. The people in my society have decided to fight, and they may end up dying. Is it fair for them to die and for me to stay alive? So I think this points to a certain kind of interactive process. Maybe people who are too afraid, seeing others go out, and that leading them to ask certain questions of themselves, to trigger certain motivations that push them beyond fear as well. And those questions, I think, have a, an element of moral questioning, of triggering a moral identity, of people asking, what are the principles for which I'm willing to stand, for which I might be even willing to die? And this could gain its most sort of prominent, sharpest relief when people who were seen as less abled or less privileged went out to protest, when those who were perhaps more able-bodied, more privileged, waited on the sidelines. So a man from the Damascus suburbs described that situation to me um, with this anecdote. He said, a man was paralyzed due to torture in prison and released after two months. He told his family that he wanted to be in the first demonstration in his village against the regime. When the people saw him participating in the demonstration in his wheelchair, they said, we cannot stay home when this paralyzed man is out. Other people's stories of breaking the barrier of fear emphasize that it wasn't necessarily a single moment, an instant where people moved through their fear. It could be something of a struggle, a commitment, a process of going back and forth with highs and lows, with a back and forth. So here I share a longer testimony from a 20-something from Daria, also in the Damascus suburbs, about his struggle to break through that barrier. So he begins talking about March 15th. There had been a call on the internet for protest on that day, and he was watching the Facebook page, seeing more and more people say that they were going to go to the protests. So he describes, I was waiting for March 15th like I was waiting for a rendezvous. I needed to see March 15th. A friend helped me cut a hole in my shirt pocket, and I bought a camera to put into it. When the moment was right, I'd open my jacket and film use the camera to film was his plan. He says, I'll never forget March 15th as long as I live. We arrived at Asuka Hamadiyya. This girl shouted, God, Syria, freedom, and that's it. To be honest, I was scared. Everyone was watching. But then I joined in. God, Syria, freedom, and that's it. The chanting made me forget all about the camera. Then the security cars came. I began to feel a sort of fear. I moved back. Security officers had sticks and started to beat people. I got in a taxi and told them to take me away. I hated the world. I hated life. I felt sadness for those young guys, how they were chanting for the benefit of the entire nation and were beaten. Sadness for why things are the way they are, why we don't have plans, we don't have organization. Why, why, why? I hadn't filmed anything. I came home sad. Why did this happen? What if it was me who'd been beaten up instead, and everyone was just looking at me without doing anything? I sat for hours and thought, this is a revolution. This is what happens in a revolution. I could get beat up, and I could die. This is for a goal. Either I accomplish that goal, or I die. Going out to the next protest, I bid my mother and father farewell. Because after what I saw the first time, I didn't think I was going to return home again. But if I don't sacrifice and other people don't sacrifice, the revolution is dead. If that guy who gets beat is going to sacrifice, I need to sacrifice too. He needs to feel my presence. What I'd like to emphasize here is that none of this was easy. Again, it wasn't that fear was broken. It was that fear as a barrier to agency was broken.
And here a mother in her mid-30s from Aleppo describes how difficult it could be to wrestle with fear. She said, oppression was residing in us. It was part of our life, like air, sun, water. We didn't even feel it. Like air is there and you never ask, where is the air? But then, in one second, in one shout, you blow it up. You defy it and stand in front of death. You have an inheritance, and after 30 years, you slam it on the ground and shatter it. Don't even imagine that it was easy to go out to a demonstration. No amount of courage allows you to just stand there and watch someone who has a gun and is about to kill you. We, as a people, were certain that they were going to kill us. Fear didn't go away because we knew there was death. But still, this incredible oppression made us go out. I encouraged my nieces and nephews to come with me to demonstrations. I felt that if they didn't try that experience, they'd be missing the real meaning of life. When you chant, you shudder and your body rises and everything you imagined comes out. Tears come down, tears of joy, because I broke the barrier. I am not afraid. I am a free being. Sadness and happiness and fear and courage, they're all mixed together in that voice, and it comes out strong. Nearly everyone who participated in demonstrations identified it with it as an experience that was not just emotional, but transformative. When I asked people to describe what demonstrations were like or what participating in their first demonstration was like, the most common answer I got back was, La Tusef. It's indescribable. We simply cannot describe the feeling of protesting for the first time. People then went on to say, well, it was like the first time I breathed, the first time I felt like a human, the first time I felt like a Syrian citizen. One man said to me, it was better than my wedding day. And when I said that in front of my wife, she refused to speak to me for a whole month. An activist from Sueda described it this way, her first demonstration. She said, I was in a demonstration, and I started to whisper, freedom. And then I started to hear myself repeating, freedom, freedom, freedom. And then I started shouting, freedom. My voice mingled with other voices. When I heard my voice, I started shaking. I felt like I could fly. I thought, this is the first time I have ever heard my own voice. I am not afraid anymore of death or being arrested or anything. I wanted to feel this freedom forever. And I told myself that I would never let anyone steal my voice again. All of this points to is that to break the barrier of fear, that is to express political voice after denying it for years, or maybe denying it for one's entire lifetime, is more than just going to an event. It can entail a discovery of a sense of self and purpose that had been buried or subjugated. That is the experience of surmounted fear that comes through in people's stories. But of course, the Syrian story did not end there, this phase of peaceful protest in 2011. The third type of fear that I see emerging in the arc of this collective narrative of Syrian stories is what I call a semi-normalized fear. As we know, the regime responded to these peaceful protests with severe violence. The opposition eventually took up arms. The regime escalated its reprisals, and the conflict evolved into some sort of a war, whether people call it a civil war, proxy war, so forth. But what this war meant for those who lived through it was a new kind of fear, fear as a way of life, living with constant fear. And what I find in people describing their experiences of living under conditions of war is two contradictory experiences of fear. On the one hand, people talk about absolute terror, ro'ob, fear of shelling and bombing, the sensory and visceral sounds of bombs, shelling from tanks, bombs coming from the sky, not knowing when it would hit, hearing a bomb 
maybe it's your neighbor wondering what will come to you next, feeling that people have no sense of where to hide, hiding, crouching in bathrooms, under stairwells, just hoping that it doesn't come over their roof. Uh, and all the various tremendously difficult psychological and physical effects of dealing with this kind of relentless terror. On the other hand, this terror, because it was relentless, became somewhat normalized. Life had to go on. If you wanted to feed yourself and your family, you had to in some way get used to it. And in this sense, fear became somewhat normalized. Fear as a way of life. Fear as the backdrop of everyday life. Fear as the constant awareness of the possibility of being killed, but going out and living your life anyway, because what else can you do? The possibility of death becoming like the air you breathe, and you either accept that or flee the country, many people said to me. So what were these elements of a fear that was both terrorizing and semi-normalized? Well, people said one aspect was the constant awareness of the possibility of death. As one man said to me, everyone is a mushru'ah shaheed, a martyr in the making or a martyr project. Another aspect of this semi-normalized fear was new kinds of knowledge created by war. People referred to this again and again by saying, even children can differentiate between bullets. My three-year-old knows the difference between that missile and that missile simply by the, sign, the, the sounds. Another aspect of the normalization of death was death and violence becoming part of the physical landscape, not only the scenes of rubble and destroyed streets and houses that we've all seen, but many people emphasizing to me that there were times when people couldn't bring bodies to the cemeteries to be buried, so had to bury them in public parks or their own gardens, literally the signs of death under the, under the grass of their very homes. Another element of the semi-normalization of fear and violence was fear or death or violence becoming part of the rhythm of life, the schedule, the timetable. And here I'll uh, cite a doctor from Homs who described to me how violence became part of his, his weekly routine. And he said, most massacres occurred after Friday prayers. There was absolute certainty that some people were going to die or get hurt, but people still went out anyway. We would go to the hospital and wait. This was every Friday, every Friday, every Friday. The demonstration would begin. A pickup truck would later arrive at the hospital, loaded with people as if they were sheep, injured or dead, one on top of the other. We'd fill all the hospital beds and immediately then line people up on the floor to examine them. We could not let people remain in the hospital because the security agents were going to come. They'd arrest the injured people and arrest those who were treating them. So we provided people with first aid and then sent them back to their homes. During the week, we'd prepare pseudonyms. We had to notify the security forces of the names of our patients. So we'd use the names of dead people. And that's how we worked. Normalization to death. Another aspect is what people described as a kind of immunity to shock. Nothing could shock or surprise them anymore because they had just seen so much. And here, an FSA fighter, a Free Syrian Army fighter from Idlib said, at first, one or two people were killed, and then 20, and then it became normal. If we lost 50 people, we'd say, thank God, it's only 50. He said, I can't sleep if there are no sounds of bombs or bullets. I feel like there's something missing. Many people said variations on that to me. A last aspect of the semi-normalization of fear, getting used to this reality of constant violence, is how fear or violence and destruction became integrated into humor, often a very kind of bitter, a bitter humor about, about the situation. And here I'll cite a, a Facebook posting from one of my interviewees which you can see sort of what had been accomplished through the uprising, but at what cost. So he wrote in his post, the most important and beautiful thing about the revolution is that people rid themselves of the words, hush, the walls have ears. To which one of his friends commented, yeah, that's true, but there are no walls left anyway. Everything is gone. What I would cite as the fourth type of fear that comes through in people's stories about their lives 
is a kind of nebulous fear, a fear of the unknown, a fear of an uncertain future. As death and destruction and war has become protracted with no end in sight, people wonder, where are we headed? Will Syria even continue to exist? Will we go home again? Who are we? What does the, the future hold? And there's a fear of this unknown, a fear of the future, um, given its nebulous uncertainty. And there are various elements and dimensions given this uncertainty. So here I'll describe some that have come through in the stories I've collected. One is certainly a fear of extremist groups, extremist ideologies and trends on the ground, which many people see as having hijacked the revolution, a revolution that's now forced to fight on two fronts, both the Assad regime and these other terrible tendencies, which don't at all represent what the uprising first called for. Here, one activist from Amuda said, I went out, I was arrested, I worked, I demonstrated, and then ISIS comes along, or some other groups come along, and little by little, they Islamicize the revolution. They steer it in the wrong direction. That creates fear. You did all of these things for the revolution, and then you see that things are only getting worse. Fear of the regime was broken, but then there started to be fear of the revolution itself. Another fear in this nebulous phase is a fear that the Syrian uprising, beginning as a domestic dispute, has been penetrated by various different foreign agendas, which aren't the agendas of the Syrian people themselves. And here, a military defector from Deir Azur put it in this way, Many countries have interests in Syria, and they're all woven together like threads of a carpet. We don't know where any of this is leading. All we know is that we're everyone else's battlefield. Most of the calls I get from Syrians are from Syrians desperate for aid of one type or another. What can I tell them? Many times, I don't even answer the phone. There are times when I wish I could just forget when I could take my wife and kids and go somewhere and raise my family. But ultimately, these fears at the political level of different groups and actors with their interests and their resources and their agendas, for Syrian citizens experiencing or watching the conflict in their country is still experienced in intimately personal ways. So one kind of fear in this intimate, personal way is something that I've come across, especially with many activists who are really active on the ground, is a fear, in some ways, of being overcome by questioning, did they do the right thing? Maybe even fear of being overcome by a sense of guilt. So here an activist from Aleppo put it to me in this way. She said, I belong to the revolution generation, and I'm proud of that. We tried our best to build something, we faced a lot, and we faced it alone, but we lost control. Most of us now are disappointed and depressed. During the first three years, our motive was positive change. For the last three years, our motive has been guilt. I ask myself, are we a cause of all that's happened? Should we have done things differently? Should we have done nothing at all? Meaning, should we have never gone out? She said, those who die or are dying are the poorest. You can't lessen their suffering, so at least you want to suffer along with them. No one can celebrate just survival. If I make a purpose out of surviving alone, does that mean that all my friends who died died for no reason? Another sense of this intimate fear, the way the nebulous uncertainty of the future is experienced in an intimate, personal, emotional, psychological way, is some people's fear of losing their own sense of self, who they are as individuals, which is paradoxical because it could be seen as the same sense of self that was actualized in that phase of going out and participating in protests when people felt like they were hearing their voice for their own time. So here the same activist from Sueda who talked about hearing her voice for the first time when she called freedom, 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 described her experience years later as a refugee. She said, one day I was visiting a doctor. She asked me to relax because I was very tense. And I realized at that moment 
that I had forgotten how people relax. I believe all the Syrians who have been forced to leave are like us. We can't find ourselves. Myself, as a person, I forget her features. I can't feel my surroundings because my feelings are still back home in Syria. Most Syrians are suffering the same feeling. We're tired and we can't bear any more blood. We're afraid. We're afraid for Syria. We're scared about the long term. Where will we end up? Where is the country heading? And perhaps even more than people's fear of losing their self and their sense of self is ultimately their feel, fear of losing loved ones. This comes through very strongly as the ultimate thing that people cannot bear even to consider. And this came through quite powerful for me when a uh, Syrian colleague described in January 2014 after it was released this trove of photographs <coughs> revealing systematic torture and starvation in regime prisons, uh, 55,000 images, so forth, that we've all heard about from the defector Caesar. And he wrote, upon seeing these images, uh, what was for me very much encapsulating a, the ultimate kind of fear. And he wrote, the most difficult part of the torture pictures is not the decomposed flesh, starved bodies, or even the knowledge that torture is both widespread and systematic these things have always been elements of our Syrian reality. What is so difficult that I do not think we have the strength to overcome is the fear that some of these pictures may show us the body of someone we know and we hope is still alive. So there we have these four types of fear. A silencing fear serving to uphold the coercive authority of the regime. A surmounted fear as a personal barrier to break through. A semi-normalized fear as people have no choice but to live under conditions of constant violence and war. And now this phase of a nebulous fear wondering where is the country headed? For how long will this conflict go on? What will become of the millions of people who've lived through this, this tragedy? I've presented them here in this almost a chronological sequence, as people describe it, has come through in most of the stories that um, I've collected. But there might be other sequences. There are possibilities for reversals. Perhaps some of those other phases of fear that have been passed through can cycle back and people experience them, them again, or have recurrences of those types of earlier fears. So on the one hand, the old silencing fears, at least it's interesting to think about, can they be returned. So for example, I did interviews with uh, refugees in Lebanon just last month, and many talked about, given the difficulties of obtaining legal residency, uh, especially men being afraid to travel from one town to another, fear of passing through a Lebanese military checkpoint, having a soldier ask for an ID card which they do not have, and perhaps facing a possibility of being deported back to Syria. So again, a fear of not traveling, very much a fear of not speaking, to, to do nothing to um, ruffle the authorities of the state in which they've sought refuge. I was in an informal settlement, tents uh, set out in the, uh, the Baqa Valley, and one man said to me that a German TV crew had come to film in their informal settlement and couldn't find a single person who was willing to stand in front of the camera and speak. So fearful were people of their very precarious situation not wanting to go and talk on television. He said in the, in the end, they just filmed children playing. Nobody would get in front of the camera and speak. So there could be a return of old silencing fears in new environments and new contexts. On the other hand, it's possible that the experience of breaking through fear can be repeated. It wasn't just that one moment in 2011. It could come again and again. So for example, some of the remarkable shows of defiance of Syrians living under ISIS rule, who've gone out to protest even, uh, even ISIS, or those who are working to expose ISIS abuses, Several media activists who have been assassinated in, in Turkey for their work reporting on ISIS and other measures. Um, uh, breaking the barrier of fear, not only in 2011, but again and again as new types of threats and new types of, of vicious authorities emerge. So 
There might also be other types of fear, but even the ones that I've outlined might not occur in a simple linear format or in a simple unidirectional way. So there's a lot still to make sense of about Syrians' experiences of fear and what we can learn from them. But for now, I'd like to offer these reflections about what I think, uh, at least I have learned to date, and others might, from listening to these types of narratives about fear and certainly about other topics as well. First, I would suggest that listening to people's stories about fear and certainly other matters is not only a way to learn about the present, the current juncture in Syrian, Syrian reality, but it's also a way to learn about the Syrian past, a past that was obscured by many citizens' prior reluctance to talk about politics. There's still a lot we don't know about Syria for the past 40 years because there wasn't a freedom to speak about it. Now, many ordinary people's newfound willingness to talk to speak, to share their stories, can be something like an opening of an archive into the lived experience under the Assad regime. And I would encourage us all, I think, I, I hope the uh, various, in various ways from the academy to the media and so forth, can try to make use of this archive and learn about Syria from the voices of Syrian citizens, about the past as well as the present. In addition, I would say that studying or analyzing or just listening to these kinds of testimonials can offer a special angle on questions of identity. There's a whole branch of psychology called narrative psychology that proposes that people make sense of themselves and their place in the world by telling stories, by situating themselves in stories. In that sense, stories are not just a way of gathering data about identity. It is itself identity information. We become who we are by telling stories, situating ourselves in a narrative. In that sense, Syrian stories about fear show how fear has shaped their understanding of what it means to be Syrian. Not just that first phase, but all the different phases of fear. That's a Syrian experience passing through those phases. As the nature of fear changes and the nature of experiencing fear, coping with it, overcoming it, dealing with it changes, what it means to be Syrian might change as well. Finally, I would say that analysis of the very act of narration narrating, and not simply the content of the narratives, the content of testimonials, reveals political agency and change. When a regime uses fear to silence its subjects, they're talking about fear, articulating its existence, identifying its sources, describing its workings, is itself a form of defiance. In describing out loud how they have experienced the regime before and since 2011, Syrians are transforming the power of that regime from a force that was so menacing it could not even be named into something whose very naming renders contestable. In that sense, Syrians' narratives about these trajectories of fear and their experiences with and through fear are an exercise in meaning-making, making sense within the revolution, and is itself a revolutionary practice. And I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you. Were you able to observe the correlation between fear and faith mm. over time, uh, especially since uh, when ISIS came into the picture, you know, the first, the I stands for Islamic, yeah? And the foundations of the Assad regime, father and son, are as secular and slash socialist as can be, uh, trying to have repressed the Islamic, uh, or had it maybe an Islamic veneer later on under the sun. But yeah, the correlation and or evolution of faith, uh, you know, with uh, fear. Thanks. Great, thanks. Um, I'll tell you what, what immediately comes to mind is not faith in terms of, of um, 
ISIS or political Islam as a, as a political ideology. But certainly people who are believers looking to God and, and, and looking to their faith as a way of coping with fear, but also just coping with the tragedy and the pain and the suffering that was imposed upon them. So for example, I did interviews with, with um, people who'd been in prison talking about either enduring torture or enduring the long waiting, not knowing if they'd get out or whenever would they get out. And certainly many of those emphasize that it was faith in God, that there's some greater meaning, some, some greater purpose, that God would be with them to keep them strong, that God would be with their mothers to keep their mothers strong during that, that terrible trial. Certainly faith is something to help people cope through that which is a sort of a microcosm of an extreme example of suffering, but through bombing and, and dealing with the death of loved ones, um, uh, talking to families of people who disappeared um, without some sort of faith that there could be some justice, some relief, some respite, some meaning um, to this greater suffering, which otherwise could seem so overwhelmingly horrific, um, I think it would be hard for a lot of people to, 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 to keep on going. I mean, certainly I spoke to secular people as well who could explain the experience in totally secular terms, but many, many people were absolute believers and, and faith gave them a sense of, of solace. So that's the, the most clear way I would see reference to faith in the context of so much suffering and fear of, of greater suffering, that much more than um, in reference to ISIS, which everyone I spoke to across the board denounced. Thank you. I get to ask you another question. Great. Terrific. <laughs> I'm grateful. Um, was there any fear of others, fear of them, um, in the sense of, and that's, that's what's so awful and tragic about the whole refugee experience, right, is that you've gone through all of this horrible experience and you know that others have seen this too and you're afraid of how they will react to you potentially or you see the media, you see Trump, you see whatever's going on in European perceptions, the world is interconnected. Is there beginning to be a fear of others, fear of them? as refugees. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's, 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 that's a really interesting um, a proposition of so many layers of fear to, to <laughs> do. I mean, certainly in, in speaking to people, because most of the people I spoke with were in uh, Jordan, Lebanon, and, and Turkey. So the experience, oh, I was looking for people to narrate their experiences. And in Syria, the experience of being a refugee in those countries absolutely was a, was a, was a prominent part of, people's, of what people talked about. Um, there was a lot of, certainly, frustration with host societies. Not fear so much, or fear of them, or fear of their sphere of us, as much as continual uh, discontent with um, how difficult life was. Um, not having, in some places, not having legal residence, certainly not um, being able to find work. The struggle to make ends meet. Most people I met were living off of their savings and watching them slowly, slowly dwindle to nothing. There was tremendous frustration with charitable organizations. People would say, some charity comes, they take pictures of us, they register our names, they say they'll help us, and then we never see them again. And that happens repeatedly. Um, frustration with the United Nations, frustration with the, the host states, feeling that host states and host societies are um, taking advantage of the refugee uh, presence. Some people would say, they're just making a profit off of us for one way or another. And um, at the same time, criticizing us that we're burdens on their country when somebody's making, getting off in, in, a, in some sort of good way and um, is, 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 is exploiting the situation. So there's, there's a, a, a whole slew of of frustrations and complaints and 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 senses of disappointment um, that there that aren't across the board. There are also some sense of, of gratitude too, uh, but a sense of that there that others are fearful of them. For the people I talked about, it would seem so unbelievable. They see themselves as being so utterly not threatening. I mean, they can barely feed themselves. How, what threat could they possibly offer to anyone else? It almost didn't come up even as a topic of conversation because it seemed too, almost too incredible thing of a, a thing to even, even discuss. 
So I was wondering, in the interviews that you have done, if you talk to the people who were supporting the government to understand what's behind their support, is it, you know, uh, believe in the government or there is some kind of fear that the whole thing is a conspiracy or that maybe the government is the last threat that's keeping the country together and mm -hmm. avoiding, you know, being divided or maybe fear as a mi minority of uh, retaliation, you know, if the whole thing okay. collapsed. So I was wondering if you got into that dimension, you know, looking at the other party's story. Yeah. I wish I had. I mean, I began this project really trying to hope I would have as wide a slice of Syrian life as possible. And then, you know, really, the, the majority of people living in, in, in these neighboring host societies are fleeing because they're from communities that rose up, that faced real extreme regime reprisals in response, and fled because of shelling and bombing. So the majority of opinion among, among refugees in this, in this area is, is anti-regime, and the majority of people I spoke to were anti-regime. I almost tried to find pro-regime voices. At, at some point, felt like it would be more fruitful just to focus on one slice than to try to do other slices um, in a way that was so scant and so brief, it was almost tokenism. So I really regret that I don't have more voices of, of pro-regime um, folks. So they're just a, a few. And the people, I mean, I, for example, one person I, I spoke to who, who identified as, as anti-regime but could talk about his family members who um, were all pro-regime. And he was from a, a, a Christian community and talked about how his mother, for example, 100% absolutely believes that the revolution will come and slaughter all Christians. He didn't believe that, but he could talk about others in his family who did sort of, from a minority religion point of view, felt, felt that way. Talked to someone else who's actually from a, from a family that's sort of quite prominent in, not the, the Assad inner circle, but the secondary circle. And he was surprisingly sympathetic to some of the motivations propelling the rebellion, but thought it would just went about it in the wrong way. In his sense is with this regime, you can't revolt. You can't call for the overthrow of the regime. There's space for reform. And he, unlike the majority of people I spoke to, was a bit more sympathetic about some of the initial reforms that Bashar al-Assad announced in those early months about repealing the, uh, the emergency law and other sorts of a national dialogue with opposition groups. And most people I talked thought those were just window dressing, you know, ink on paper and didn't amount to anything. He was a bit more sympathetic of work with Bashar and he is still a good president and there is possibility for reform and, and um, it was the revolt's fault that it, it went in a, in a, in a more um, all or nothing sort of dimension. So those were the, the few voices I was able to get, but I, I really regret that the majority of sort of my sense of, of pro-regime opinion comes from things I've read rather than people I've spoken with. Thanks, Professor, for the talk. It's yeah. uh, very nice, and the way you narrate things also is, uh, is quite significant. Uh, the question is, yes. is there hope? I mean, uh, uh, how do Syrians perceive uh, the near future, not the very far future? I mean, do people believe that they are going back, uh, things will settle down in their favor, uh, mm -hmm. they will win at the end of the day, which makes sense at least from a historical perspective? Yeah. Or are people completely disparate? I mean, what's, 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 the, what's the major feeling here? Is it, is it optimism? Uh, or is it what? It's over? What, what exactly? Yeah. I mean, from, from your meetings with them. Yeah. Because this is the, the, the thing that we lack. I mean, we can see the news, we can see the bombings, we can understand the strategic stance of each and every uh, country intervening in, in, in Syria. But the problem is that most of us, of course, we don't have this privilege of meeting the people and sitting with them and talking with them and understanding how they think, mm -hmm. especially the people who were very severely affected by what happened. Yani they left their homes, they lost a lot of their families, so on and so forth. Okay. Thank you so much. No, thank you. Um, and again, you know, I can't speak in the name of Syrians, but I can be offer as, a, as an observer what the kind of the sense that I've gathered from, from people I've, I've spoken to as a, as a researcher. And I, mean, I think there can be contradictory feelings. I mean, every, everyone, every human being needs hope in order to get out of bed in the morning to go another day. So I think that there's you know, an active, willful desire to have hope, even as the conditions around make it increasingly difficult to have hope. So for example, um, when the, the latest ceasefire was declared and you saw 
demonstrations all over Syria, people going out again to demonstrate. I mean, like it's 2011 again, going out and demonstrating. I saw pictures from, from demonstrations yesterday, of, you know, that picture um, of uh, a popular demonstration in, in Aleppo, surrounded by, by total destruction and the pouring rain and people going out with the flag again to chant and to call for the uprising. So I think those moments like that, you know, give you goosebumps of hope of there is still a spirit of revolution, and there's, this is a still a popular uprising. There are layers of war and intervention and so forth, but that that thread of of a, of a revolution is not dead. It's still it's still there in people's hearts, and given space to go out and protest or express the desire to live free, people still still seize it. So that I think is a space of hope. Um, but the larger picture is one of, of of a tremendously sad and tragic situation. I can say. So the arc of, because I started doing these interviews in 2012 and then 2013, 15, 16, I can see and sort of trace a sense of a different type of tone of people when I see them in each of those, those years. In 2012, when I spoke to people, people had their bags packed. They were ready to go back to Syria at any moment. Because there was still talk at that time of, oh, the regime is on the cusp of collapse. People I talked to were ready to go home. Um, 2013, you began to see people talking about maybe, maybe Syria's lost. The beginnings of people, at least when I was speaking with, beginning to talk about the possibility of perhaps going to Europe, as opposed to saying, no, it was almost a, a political stance to stay waiting on the border to make your life very close to where you can see Syria across the border from Turkey or Jordan so you can go back, beginning to think about well, I've put my life on hold for, for two years, for three years. I've lived the uprising day by day. What about me as a human being? The sort of the strata of young 20-something activists, young guys who thought, well, maybe I want to get married and have kids. Maybe I want to finish the university studies that I dropped my sophomore year to become a full-time activist. Beginning to say, what about me? But still doing it in almost a hushed voice, almost a sense of, of guilt to even think about yourself as a person as opposed to the cause. By the time I came back in 2015, some of those people who are just beginning to even think, what about me, are now in Germany. At some point said, the country's destroyed. And it, often people would say things like, Surya Rahat. Yeah, I mean, it's, go back to what? But there's never completely that sense. There still is a sense of, of a commitment to the country and a commitment to its people. So, and as you see now, the waves going to Europe. I did an interview with a, an activist in, in Gaziantep, Turkey, right on the, the Syrian border in January. And he said, you know, one by one, more and more of my friends have gone on to Europe. But I'm committed to staying here because it feels, to go to Europe feels, he said, feels like giving up. And I'm not going to give up. I'm going to stay here on the border. But he said, but what? Soon I'm going to be talking to myself. You know, slowly no one's left. So there's... I think there's a desire to hold on to hope, but there's also a sense of realism. Anybody can look at the numbers, look at the pictures, and see, and see the reality. And, and, um, and this, of course, is you know, largely due to, I think, the failure of the international community to offer any type of real, decisive um, engagement to prevent this tragedy from just unfolding. Syrians did all they could possibly do, and then more so, um, of sacrifice, of struggle, to, um, to win this, this, this battle, but we're facing a more powerful enemy supported by even more powerful allies, and uh, we're abandoned in some ways to their, their fate. So it's heroic to still search for hope and have hope under those conditions, but the world has not been kind to, to, to Syrians to search for hope on their, on their own, to make it of their own will. Um, so it's, it's harder and harder with time, I think. Speaking of hope, um, yeah. one question I wanted to ask. You said you interviewed a lot of people that yeah. are based in Turkey, Lebanon, um, Syria. Would it be beneficial to maybe interview refugees that have made it to Europe? Um, I recently got back from uh, Chios in Greece, um, oh, volunteering for a refugee camp there. And, um, you know, people that make it across the, the Turkish borders, um, have very high hopes. You have refugees walking around, you have kids walking around asking you whether they can buy cameras in uh, Germany, if Germany is beautiful, um, mm -hmm. whether they can go to school um, to Germany, in Germany. So, you know, running a comparison maybe of, you know, the, the, the types of fear that we've identified in Lebanon, in Syria, in Turkey, and maybe 
um, a comparison with you know uh, perceptions and, and the types of fear that might um, exist um, in European refugee camps might um, might be beneficial. I don't know what your thoughts are um, yeah, on that. Uh, absolutely, I think you've you've read my calendar because um, I yeah I, I don't have the ticket yet, but but as of June sixth, I should be headed to, to Germany to spend the summer in in Europe. So at this point, plans to be in Germany briefly, Denmark and Sweden, and, and I think it would be amazing if I could get to Greece as well. So yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, so thank you for, and I'd love to, be able to talk to you afterwards about your suggestions in in Greece. But um, and it's kind of almost the you know, things I didn't expect when I began this project, when I went to Jordan for the first time in 2012, it, that never occurred to me. One, that I would need, even need to do a round of interviews in 2016, and two, that I would be going to Denmark to do, to, you know, to do them. So, uh, yeah, I think that um, yeah, in order to stay, to stay current, to stay accurate, and to take advantage of, of this kind of comparison and variation and not have my conclusions be too slanted because I'm not seeing this whole other slice of a story that's still unfolding. It's really a must to go to, go to Europe and maybe even interview um, Syrians who've arrived in the US when I get, get back in a, in a few weeks. So thank you for confirming. It's a good way to, to spend, spend time.